Chessie just opened her business. I can't stand her. Whatever you do, don't go there. Squeegee Inc. Podcast Season 2. This podcast is sponsored by Blind Maggot, Magna Colors, Screen Print World, Target Transfers, and Adobe Creative Suite. Hey, it's Mike Michalow. It's here, Jesse. It's good to see you. And thanks for everyone who's joining in. I am the author, well, if you can see the screen behind me, of many business books, Profit First being my most popular, um, but Clockwork, Get Different, Fix This Next. And uh, just, I love everything about small business. Mm -hmm. And I believe that our global economy uh, is dependent upon the success of small business. So what happens in the UK is serving everywhere in this globe. And what's happening here, where in the US is serving everyone in the globe so uh, yeah. let's, let's rally small business. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Profit First was probably the one that I read. I might have got a bit overwhelmed with the back end of the book. And then I was like, okay, let's put that down for a second, <laughs> put it down for a month. And then I found out that you've actually trained accountants to be able to process this and implement this in people's businesses. And then I got on board because then I can just do the like every Monday, do my allocations. And yeah. that really just took the weight off me and just completely transformed the business. I had no idea to pay myself first because yeah. all the other business books you read go, Oh, don't pay yourself out of your business for like 18 months. And I'm like, how, how are you surviving on that? So yeah. Can you tell me about like how people can implement it and what the whole idea sure. of the book is? So there's, there's two approaches. One is you can self implement. So the basic structure of Profit First is that when money flows into our bank account, most business owners see that money and say, oh, I have all this money to spend on the next thing I need, that new computer equipment or hiring someone or whatever. It's mm -hmm. very reactionary oriented. And although we are directed to read out those accounting statements, understand our key performance indicators, know the metrics, while we know we should do that, what we naturally do is we log into our bank account. Mm. So I, I love to study behavioral psychology. And one of the findings is that it's very difficult for us to change our natural wiring, but yeah. we can channel what we already do to an outcome we want. So Profit First is a system that actually encourages you to use your bank accounts, keep logging in, keep using those bank accounts. And then uh, we're going to pre-allocate money for its intended use at your bank. Mm. So when money comes in, some is going to go to profitability. The, one of the main reasons you probably started your business is for uh, wealth accumulation. Yeah. Um, some of that money is going to go to a salary for you, which is different than profit. Profit is a reward for investing or starting a business. And then compensation, owner's comp, is the pay for a normalized salary, the work you do. Then there is uh, tax, and tax is for tax liabilities and so forth. And the last account is OPEX for the operations of the business. Mm -hmm. We call these the foundational five accounts, income plus the four others. And the idea is money flows in, we carve it up to these different accounts. And now before we spend a dime, we know what its intended use is. It's, it's the envelope system applied to business. Yeah. So one strategy is do it on your own. Some people struggle with staying within the rules. And that's yeah. very normal. It's kind of like, we all know we need to exercise, but how many of us are effectively doing it ourselves? So the next level is have a trainer. And mm -hmm. a trainer is someone that holds you accountable. You're paying them for the service. So they hold you to it. But secondly, they've taught those exercises and strategies to perhaps hundreds or thousands of other, of other clients, and they know the right exercise to do the right way so you don't get injured. You do it appropriately, and you build and achieve your goals of strength or health or whatever they may be. Hmm. Well, Profit First, we start an organization we have in the UK. We have a location in outside London called Profit First Professionals. And our organization, what we do is we've certified accountants, bookkeepers, and business coaches in being trainers of Profit First. So they're great at helping implement the system, enforce it through accountability, but also doing it in a safe way, yeah. in a way that you roll it out over time and that you build toward it. The biggest mistake I see people do with Profit First is they go all in, Jesse. I mean, they're like, oh, I'm going to be so profitable. I'm going to do this now. And it's such an abrupt shift. It's like throwing on tons of weight into the gym or, or trying to run 10 miles or 10 kilometers when you haven't before, and now you injure yourself. So this is a real, uh, Profit First Professionals are really good at moving in incremental but consistent mm. steps and driving a business to its healthiest financial status ever. 
Yeah, I, I can tell you some of the stumbling blocks that I had, which meant that in my head, I didn't think I was either worthy of an accountant or I didn't need one or I couldn't afford one because, um, you know, you get an accounting system and you're like, oh, it's just pushing. <laughs> Basically, you wait until deadline day and then you have like two days of hell and panic. Then you haven't been saving up the money. So it's very, very stressful. And then you just empty your bank account to pay these taxes and then you're left feast and famine again. Yeah. And I feel like feast and famine is a thing that happens with a lot of business owners. They see the money, they get paid and then like, oh, now I can, but you, you have to actually strip the profit out and hide it in the account. Because if you wait to the end of the year to try and wait to see what profit you made at the end and like, I don't know, see what's in the bank account at the end of the year, it won't be there because you've been like leaking it out with all your money leaks over the year. So yeah, it's quite it's quite desperate seeing your bank account at the end of the year and thinking, oh, I thought I did really well. I had this huge turnover and then there's nothing left. There's nothing so, left. Mm. Yeah, huge turnover and yet nothing for us. And then the tax bill comes and we're like, where am I going to find this money? Mm. Most entrepreneurs are in this feast or famine. So if we have a month with good turnover, we feel fantastic. The deposits have come in, business is crushing it. What's so interesting is there is a behavioral tendency called Parkinson's law. And what Parkinson's law is as a resource expands, we consume more. It's a behavioral response. The classic examples with food. If I serve you know, one chocolate chip cookie to be eaten, I'll eat one. But if I serve a dozen, I'll eat more than one. The greater the serving, the greater the consumption. So what happens when these businesses, they have a high level of turnover, the business expenses usually go up almost immediately. Then they have a bad few months of turnover, but the expenses are now here. There's this gap mm. and that triggers debt and struggle. And the businesses are, are in a dangerous spot. What Profit First does is it leverages Parkinson's law. It puts a gap in. So as turnover, as money comes in, we take a percentage of those deposits immediately and hide them from the business effectively. So now we start experiencing the true available cash for a business. And, and we can't go above and beyond that. Mm. So it, it forces the business to eat only one cookie. Yeah. 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 And yeah. that thing, basically what my uh, Profit First accountant did is they literally went through my whole accounts for like three or four months and it scared the hell out of me. I was like, oh God, here we go. It's like peeling back all of the bad stuff that I've been doing. And then highlight every single thing that you don't really need. And it was, it was too much. It was... It's like sharing all the sins that you've been doing, which is, and shows up all your habits, but that is eating away at money that you could be bringing home to your family. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's quite jarring, but it needs to be done, doesn't it? So yeah, I think, I think it's an amazing book. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm, I'm very proud to share that we have over 700,000 businesses that have implemented Profit First globally. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's growing by the, by the minute now. Yeah. And what's so interesting is the the pushback that I've gotten from people is, well, it's not a logical system. Um, if you just look at your numbers, you will know where your profits are and you know what to do. And mm -hmm. the truth is it's not a logical system. It's based upon human behavior. Most entrepreneurs uh, run their business based upon emotion, got instinct and so forth. And the logic uh, isn't applied in certain aspects. Uh, so, if everyone was was running their business purely logically, uh, we wouldn't need a system like this. But our behavior, one of the key behaviors, is when something is a final consideration or last consideration, it usually gets deferred or delayed. And we've been told traditionally that our sales, our turnover, minus our expenses results in the profitability. Mm. Profit is, at least in the States, we call it the bottom line, the year end, the final take. All of those phrases say it's not important now. And it's human nature. If it doesn't have to be worried about now, we don't worry about it. It's the manana syndrome. Just wait, mm -hmm. wait. And that's why when the end of the year comes around, when we look at the profit number or the tax bill comes, we go into a panic state. So what profit first does is it leverages human behavior and says what comes first gets prioritized. So as turnover comes in, we're going to extract a percentage as profit first, hence profit first, yeah. hide it away, extract other key components too that serve the business's health fiscal health and the owner's fiscal health. And then what's left over is what's truly available to operate your business. Hmm. I tell people, if you want to have, say, a 20% profit, take a 20% profit. And then yeah. you will be told exactly what's available to operate the rest of the business. Take it first. Yeah. Yes. 
this is I'm, I'm going to like quickly shift because yeah, I, think, I think get because all the different books cover different business problems don't they so mm. like um something that I'm genuinely troubleshooting right now is I'm opening up uh so I've got screen print studio and then I'm opening up a t-shirt shop in town yeah which I print, I print the shirts, sell them. And at the moment I'm doing it on a market store, but I've just opened a retail premises. And I'm trying to think of ways to work with other local businesses because I feel like we're on a local level. I'm not really competing online with this particular business. Um, so how can I integrate myself into the community so much that, you know, it elevates us and gets us marketing. And I want to run a couple of like my one idea off you and then I'd love to hear it. You just say if you think it's silly or not. I've got two actually. So right. I was in Greek, I was in Greece and I saw this restaurant has made this really weird train. And they, they take the tourists on this little model train all yeah. through the town, do a tour, and then they park the train at the restaurant, and then all the tourists get off and eat at the restaurant. And I was like, wow, that's that's like perfect, isn't it? Like yeah. it's all got the advertising boards on it. So I was thinking like maybe I could get electric scooters and have them as like you can hire them out outside the the shop or just give them to free on loan to people or the staff members could go. That's I'm not fully sure on that one. Well, let me start off. I, I think <laughs> it's a great idea and it's worthy of test. You know, the first question I ask myself is what is the objective I have? So we're going to reverse engineer this. Mm. So let me ask you, more people coming to your shop does that generally drive more business? I'm thinking, so I haven't opened the shop yet. It's not open. Okay. So I'm literally just, uh, I think what I'm trying to do is create conversations in the town. So that people are like, what are all these weird electric scooters? Or like, what are they? Because they spot our car already, which is like branded. But I'm trying yeah. to just like spark conversations like that way. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Mm -hmm. So we we want, so our end goal right now is just to build brand awareness. Yeah. So, okay. So in that context, then I start thinking, what are all the things I can do to trigger that? And how do I do it as inexpensively as possible as a test? Because if I do a big grand test and it doesn't work, I've exhausted any of my funds. Mm. So if people want to be aware of the brand, maybe I like your idea. And I was want to brainstorm about it. Maybe what yeah. we do is we go to all of the complementary businesses or non-competitive businesses mm. around and say, Hey, would you be willing to put this crazy sign in your window? And um, tell Chessy that, you know, Jimmy sent you. And when we hear your name, we give them a special gift because they were sent by your store mm. or, or something like that. So now both you are getting brand awareness, but they're getting recognition for being the source. Mm. So I start thinking about stuff like that. Um, yeah. sometimes crazy stunts, uh, build attraction because the, the newspapers pick it up. Mm. Could you hire a hot air balloon and it flies over town with a massive sign saying, We've opened, you've been waiting for it. We opened today or, or something crazy or, or maybe a hate sign where a sign comes over and says, Chessie just opened her business. And I can't stand her. Whatever you do, don't go there. Yeah. You know, people are like, what is going on? Stuff like that was rooted in is the only way to garner attention of a consumer is that you do something that is inconsistent with the noise. Mm. So if we do something that everyone else is doing, they're not going to see it. But if you have a train going around town or a hot balloon go over or something that jars them, you'll have their attention for a minute. And then of course it needs to be attractive. Something that compels them to go to your store. Yeah. So I think you got something in your idea. I just want to create I've some got, more ideas too. I've got one more. So right on. I would like to make some poker chips. So we've got a marketing budget of say like 500 pounds a month, like okay. just to start out with, that's just what we've put. Okay. So I, I was thinking, we make some poker chips and then each we give that 500 pounds to a local business. So like the coffee shop and we say, everyone who brings in one of these poker chips, that's worth a coffee. So they bring in the poker chip and then they get the free coffee from the other business. So then they're like, Oh, seriously. And then they just, it's, it's not drawing people in, but when they are in, they've got the chip. It also links to another business. And then it's kind of like, I don't know, building conversation and they might have yeah, like I a love that. That, that sound, Yeah, you're, you're mm. gamifying it. Mm. So I like the idea too. What I like is it's very inexpensive. It's unique. Maybe other businesses aren't doing it. It's collaborative. Um, and so then my question is, can we gamify it more? Could we say that we've, we've distributed 25 chips to businesses that we're not going to share who they are? Throughout <laughs> That's our a good idea. 
Yeah. yeah. So we, we deserve thing. 25. And if all 25 are discovered and brought back to our store today, we do a free round of coffee for every guest the next morning or something cool. Mm. And now it becomes a gamification and, and a collaboration. You know, we, we found all of them, but there's one secret store. We can't find where it is. And people are panicking around, not panicking, but <laughs> excited about it and moving quickly. Mm. So I love that idea. And, and I just encourage you to keep on thinking of iterations of it. What I really love about the idea is it's so inexpensive. We can yeah. test it out and most ideas won't work. It doesn't mean they're failures. It simply means that there's components of it that didn't work and we have to iterate. So maybe the poker chips it doesn't work because no one knows it exists. So maybe we have to be more verbose about mm. it. Or maybe we have to tell the stores in the beginning, um, they put up a, a symbol saying, we, we have a chip here or something to inspire it. But an idea, we have to plan to iterate at least five, sometimes even 10 times yes. to really find what's working. Yeah. Um, there's something that drives me mad when I talk to my other studio owner friends and I say something like, oh, how are you using social media or how are you getting new customers? And then sorry to all of my studio owner friends who say this, but they say like, oh, word of mouth. And yeah. I feel like what's the, you've just said word of mouth to me. And I don't know if this is just me. <laughs> it just it means like, I'm just relying on the gods to yeah, like whoever it. comes across me, who walks past is, it doesn't mean anything to me. Is that something that riles you up or <laughs> yeah, w- word of mouth? Word of mouth is very flattering when you hear it. Oh, someone referred me. They think highly of me, but it's something we can't throttle and control. Mm. So I can't say, Oh, we need some more business this week. Where's the word of mouth coming? Mm. Word of mouth is a natural tendency. So that. Word of mouth, I consider the icing on the cake, but it's not the cake. Our, our job is to build a cake. We have to build something that's throttleable. We can turn it up or turn it down. Yeah. You, you can do a poker chip event three days in a row, or you could say, we're not going to do it for a little bit because of the business that's coming in. So we also want to recognize word of mouth. So when, when, when we do hear someone talking about us or spreading the word, we want to go back to that source if we can identify them and, and show our appreciation and thanks for doing yeah. that just to encourage it. But that should not be... Uh, our core focus on, on marketing because it's just unpredictable. Mm. That's my yeah, how do you, Yeah. You're not that. Yeah. I think it's just being accidentally skewed over time to being like, Oh, I go on my reputation. That's yeah. slightly different. And I think yeah. it's just, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, listen, and word of word of mouth is amazing. Like I, I'm not speaking poorly about it. The vast majority of my readers discover my books because they heard it from someone else. Yes. It is extraordinary. But I believe what word of mouth is, is representative of the service experience or your product. If it's so great that it's remarkable, people have to remark about it. They will tell others, but to fuel the momentum, particularly when we need surge demand and so forth, that inevitably is direct, not direct marketing, but it's a form of marketing that's directly under our control. Mm. I think it's that one thing that stuck out. I don't even know which book it was now, but it was the fact that you can turn on or turn off the marketing. So like one guy in an example that you said, he sends out books to all his, he sends out maybe even your books to clients. Yeah. 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 Yeah, He sent a book. Yeah. Gabe Pina is his name. That was in Get Different. Yeah, exactly. So he's sending out those, but he's actively doing it. And then he can send out less books or he can go, Oh God, I need some more clients. I need some more leads. Yeah. It's like lead generation that we're trying to do for ourselves in there. Uh, yeah. And what he did is interesting what he did with the books, just to build on that story, mm. is he applied the model. So in Get Different, there's a model. It spells dad, D-A-D. Yeah. But there's three elements that make marketing effective. First of all, it must differentiate from the existing noise. Humanity, we are wired that if we experience something that, that we are used to and we know what it is, we ignore it. Meaning... It's like white noise. If I hear a car honking its horn coming down the road, I won't necessarily look at it because all cars honk their horns. Mm. So that's why in a, uh, a rescue vehicle, an emergency vehicle has sirens and often different sounds to disrupt the noise pattern. Mm. So first we must differentiate. Second of all, it must be attractive, meaning the, the person receiving this message must say, oh, this is for me. And then it must tell them what to do. D for direct. So in Gabe's case with those books, he was mailing out books, but he also realized while people may appreciate uh, receiving a book, it's different. They don't get books all the time. Most people won't read a book. It's too much to consume. Mm. They didn't invest in it. They didn't buy it. So why read it now and start stacking up? So he took it further. What he did was his first experiment, he sent out books and the response was marginal. 
Then he started adding little yellow sticky notes. Mm. And he added about five or six of them that highlight certain pages. The first one said, I realize you may not have time to read this book, but I believe it could transform your business. I hope it served you. I highlighted four or five important pages. Then you flip to the next one and it highlighted and he circled a paragraph saying, this paragraph is what I think you could do. And he did the same. Mm. Very last sticky note said, again, I realize you may not be able to read this entire book. I want you to know that I can help uh, explain this to you. So if you're up for a 15 minute call, I'll walk you through this because I really do want to help you transform your business. Yeah. That got results. Yeah. But he could have easily quit and go, oh, books don't work. Mike's full of it. Correct. It's these five to 10 iterations. And sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. And that's why we want to keep our expenses low. If I have 500 pounds a month, I don't want to spend 500 pounds on the first experiment and say, oh, I want to see if I can do it for 50 pounds and then try it 10 more times that month and and play with it to see what works. Okay. But even just hearing that, don't do electric scooters, do basic scooters. And then you can have that's where I'm that's where I'm going. Yeah. Mm. And 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 maybe, you know, maybe find that someone steals a scooter and and now it becomes a big cost. And so maybe it's um maybe you hire a limousine driver who is willing to work for 250 pounds over a couple of days and it, it, it's a limousine and it says free rides around town. And you're just ping pong people around town <laughs> has your name on it. And maybe that's remarkable because it won't get stolen. So you know, yeah. we start iterating. That's a scooter idea. Just now it's kind of a motorized version. Yeah. But I don't, the, my town is so small and the news is so boring that like a tree got taken from someone's bakery and that was on the front of the newspaper. So it's oh like God. someone stole my scooters. Like, okay. It could be, that could be your best thing. That, that environment is the best when yeah. a fallen tree gets news. So would a, a bicycle, <laughs> a, a bicycle with one of those bench seats in the back, a tricycle. Mm-hmm. What if you hired someone to ride a tricycle around and giving free rides around town that might be big news because you're the person doing this. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've also noticed in the books there's a trend and then like following, like looking you up on social media and stuff, you don't really rely on like Instagram and TikTok to generate your things, but it seems like you're trying to focus people into email marketing. Do you think that is like a lost, I mean, a forgotten resource? Do you, is, is that still your focus trying to get people on yeah, your email I'm so, list? Uh, yeah, email is... Email is still dollar for dollar the most effective. It's you know it's very inexpensive, and I could send out an announcement to my list this second, and within an hour, within minutes, I'll probably have some transactions. Mm. Now, the damage, of course, if I keep on asking for transactions, the, the list will disengage. Uh, but if I went on social media or TikTok, I don't have necessarily that same response because in social media, I'm beholden to those organizations, algorithms, and rules. In email, I own the database. I have direct mm. control over it. So I still believe something you can control directly is more valuable something than something where you can be turned off. And uh, email is not the perfect potion. Uh, it, it is saturated. So many people do it. It's maybe not the best tool, um, but it is where I'm concentrating my efforts for now. Yeah. Yeah. So like, what other tools like email lists are you thinking that people are like neglecting? Yeah. So when it comes to marketing, I look at who's already established with the community that I'm looking to serve. So for me to build recognition, just like anyone else takes a lot of time, but is there someone that's already in that community and would they be willing, would it be a win-win for them to bring me into that community for Mm -hmm. them to talk about a book or whatever? So one technique I use is I'll go to my existing clients uh, I'll identify who my best clients are, ones that really value me and yes. I enjoy working with. That's the whole concept as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, oh, great. So then I'll ask them, I'll say, where do you congregate? What what social media do you listen to? Or what clubs do you go to? What memberships do you have? And they can be a gateway uh, bringing me in and say, oh, mm. I didn't know you're part of the local golf club. Uh, would it be possible for me to to do a little presentation on on how I can help people at the golf club? Now, the power here is maybe 15 people show up and social media has this illusion that there's 50 billion people there. Why would I ever go for 15 when I can get the easy 50 billion people or whatever the number is? (laughs) Well, the thing is, when you have a relationship with someone, your best client, they are likely hanging out with people that are similar to them. Mm. Birds of a feather flock together. So they can be a great introduction the transfer of no like and trust. There's an awareness of you because you're brought in by someone trusted. Those 15 people may be so much more likely to do business with you than this esoteric massive number. 
So yeah. I look for congregation points. And who knows? You may have someone, and I just had it recently, someone who's a big social media influencer that falls in love with what you do and is willing to spread the word for you. And sure enough, you get access to lots of people for the first time that never discovered you before. Yeah, that is that is exactly what I have actually found in real life. So like one example is like we do a market stall on a high street last Sunday of the month. And then we found that all of the people who are coming to us were like these, they weren't actually our target market, but it doesn't matter. That's just who, who came in the end. But they've got disposable income. They're buying things like nice beer at the pub, like the fancy beer. They're, you know, they, they're of a certain age group where they do have disposable income. Yep. And then they're like, oh, you're doing really well at the local ale festival. And I was like, uh, uh, I don't know. We went there and we made five times more on one day than we make. Like we literally made like four months worth of revenue on one day because it was like a hyper specific. Yes. Not many people there, maybe 400. And it was just blew, blew our minds. Like we're booked in this year to do that. There's, a, there's an illusion specific. that mm. there's an illusion that quantity is better than quality. And that's not the truth. I remember a long time ago, someone saying, I have you know, a million Twitter followers or whatever it was. And I was like, wow, great. But does anyone buy from you? And, and the person shirked away and said, no. So what we want is people that really see value in us. So 400 people and, and those customers, they're, they're, they now know of you and mm. they can start promoting you and you can leverage that network intentionally and get into more groups. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of different avenues we can do, but something that looked very dramatic and I actually kind of got a lot of um, bad comments for when I implemented in from one of your books is the pumpkin patch. Yeah. So I was overwhelmed. I wasn't making enough money and I was like genuinely probably making myself sick with stress with how much I took on. I yeah. took on everything. I did websites for people. I did, you know, flyers, Anything they told me, I was the person to go to to do the weird printing thing. Yeah. And then I read the pumpkin patch and I was like, I'm just doing it. I can't do it. There's either I go sick or I go broke or I don't know. So I did yeah. the pumpkin yeah, yeah, yeah. patch. Yeah. <laughs> you just take all your best customers. No, you just fire basically 80% of your horrible customers that you don't enjoy working for. And then well, that's an extreme case. The 80% you said? Yeah, like yeah, wow. I did, I kind of took pumpkin patch and the 80 20 roll. Yep, 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 yep. yep. <laughs> Which is, you know, and then I did the chart and I was like, oh my God, all these people, if I pick up the phone and they've just called me, I'm like, oh God, I've got to prep myself for it. Yeah. Got, got rid of them. Actually looked at jobs and broke down what is profitable and it wasn't the, yeah. the, the large jobs. Took all the jobs away that are like next day and it just, yeah. I, I literally can, work maybe one or two days a week instead of up until 10 o'clock at night now because I'm just okay and are you it. is the business healthy are you profitable yes. yeah yes so like, that, now that's I the am. key yeah now, now I, know I am this is the great irony so what I explain in that book is that a portion sometimes it's 80 percent you usually it's less usually it's about 20 percent but a portion of your clients actually are compromising your business mm. your emotional health your financial well-being you're not making money on them. And so just by removing these unfit clients, and I'm not even suggesting they're bad people. I'm just saying they're not fit for our business. Yes. Removing those clients uh, avails you to cut all those associated costs. And the biggest cost in small business usually is the investment of time by the owner. Mm. How much time we try to cater to them and care for them, which then distracts us from caring for our best customers. And we, if, we, if we do work over and over again, sometimes our lowest customers actually cost us money to keep them. But this illusion we have is, but but their revenue, I can't lose their revenue. Oh, that, you know, 2,000 pounds a month you're making is costing you 4,000 pounds to do it. It's actually going to make you more profitable. Mm -hmm. So firing them. But here's what's interesting. Once we get rid of those clients, now it avails us to focus on catering to our best clients. So now we can pay more attention to them. And inevitably, they're grateful for it. They want to do more business with us uh, or through gratitude, they introduce us to other people or they allow us to get access to their networks where we can market ourselves. Hmm. So yeah, I suggest when people read the pumpkin plan that the first thing they do when it comes to terminating a client is start off slow because we have to build some courage. We're very afraid of firing client and losing revenue because we can't see all the gains. So fire one or two. Um, and this is not, you know, you can, you can introduce them to a competitor or something like that, and then see how you land, see how it affects your business and then do the process again. 
Mm. Um, that's, that's, that's how you do it. And, and this was translated from, from pumpkin patches specifically in growing a colossal pumpkin. The biggest restrictor around that is other pumpkins. So yeah. removing all these other pumpkins allows the explosive one to grow. So removing bad clients allows bigger clients to grow. Removing distracting work allows the big work, the important work to grow. Mm. Yeah, it was, th- it was reading that book. And I just literally the next day, I was part of some weird subscription. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, where you have, where you sell like little offshoot businesses to other people franchise. I was part of like some internet building website franchise. And I just hacked that little arm off, sold it to someone else. Yeah. Made money on selling it to someone else, which was brilliant. And then I just get to deflect nicely all of that stuff that I'm not even good at doing just because I yeah. thought I should, I should be doing it because it's money through the door. Cause I was desperate for the money. Cause I wasn't sorting out my money. That's, I think that's the trap. Yeah. I think totally. It, yeah. I totally agree. Mm. Yeah. And, and when we diversify, when we go down all these tangential paths to help uh, an unfit client, we can't become masterful of the things that we need to be doing. Yeah. So that, what things have you updated in the new version of the book? Because you've got like a new pumpkin plan, haven't you? No, like actually the wrong? pumpkin plan, the pumpkin plan has not been updated. Clockwork and Profit First have both been updated. Mm. Pumpkin plan, it maybe one pumpkin. day soon. <laughs> I've been asked to do it. Um, so I'm trying to get the round to making that actually happen. Mm. So um, but, yeah, but there's a lot of things going around automation. So is that why clockwork got priority? Yeah, clock, yeah. exactly. So clockwork... Um, there's two things I'm working on right now. Clockwork, I re-released the book. It's it's 60% new content. It was a full rewrite of that book and simplifying the system. Yes, there's a lot with automation. Um, there's a lot of new things we can do. So Clockwork simplified it and addresses that. The goal is seven owner doing the work. We need to be a designer of the outcomes and remove ourselves from doing the work. And how to make that transition. It's, it's mm-hmm. not a flip of the switch. It's a slow progression. The other book uh, that I have coming out now is called All In. It's not released mm. yet, but it's coming out uh, in about six months from today. And it's how to build, how great leaders build unstoppable teams. The most common question I hear from business owners is, how do I get my colleagues to act like owners? Mm. How do I get them to act like me? And I think I found the formula to do that. And that's what that book's about. That's a tease because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about to hire as well. And that's something that we oh, talk yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> Whole so, new approach on hiring that I think will will radically shift the approach. I don't think interviewing is a efficient or effective process. I think there's another way to do it. It's called uh, workshops. I, I took it from sports and I found something that in the sports arena that they were doing that translates to business so well. Um, and some some businesses are already doing it very effectively. Just a little hint because I've literally got interviews next week, Mike. But yeah, so you just get them in and do practical things over sitting them down because that just makes them nervous and sweat and climb well, up well, anyway, yeah, right? Yes, <laughs> and yeah, it doesn't make them nervous. But yeah, have them do the work, but do it through an educational standpoint. So it's not about making them nervous and sweat to prove themselves. It's about educating themselves. So as an example, say I want to hire a bookkeeper. What I could put on is a workshop on how to do bookkeeping. And people will come in and I watch who has the desire and thirst. Those are the key indicators to learn more. Those are people that are expressing extraordinary potential. Those mm-hmm. are the folks to hire. Now, if I need someone that comes on that already has a skill set, I don't want to bring in entry level people. In that case, I'd say the prerequisite is you have to have you know core bookkeeping skills. And this class, this workshop, I'll teach you how to do high level bookkeeping skills. And you don't have to have the talent as the owner. I could bring someone in that's a bookkeeper to teach that. And what everyone gets is everyone that participates, they they're learning improves. I give them a certificate of accomplishment when they're done. Um, they even pay to participate, always have people invest because then yeah. they're vested. And then as I observe the class, I cherry pick people and say, Oh, we'd love to offer you an opportunity in this space. Would you want to work mm. with us? That's a really good idea. Yeah. So that's like shifting what I could do instead of having, cause you're not getting the best retail assistant. If you sit them down in a chair and say like, what are your strengths, but just bring them out on the market. Yeah. Just have them. And then if they do actively engage on their own, then that's probably the winner. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky, but yeah, yeah I understand why you're taking things from different arenas and stuff, especially I, something relatively dry, like accounting, <laughs> like normally it's done on, 
it's, it's seen as like quite a boring, uh, you yeah, know, boring and it's, it's traditional interviews and, and we rarely find uh, good candidates that way. The, the funny thing is with this method, you can approach people that are already employed and just looking to get better. The, many times there's great candidates who are already working. Um, they don't even aren't considering alternatives, but if you can teach them an alternative and then offer them to do that work, they may want to move over. In traditional interviewing, we got to have it timed perfectly that someone who's looking for a job finds your ad and matches up. So the odds are against us. In workshops, we expand the, the odds. Thank you so much. I think if people don't get something good from that, then they just read your books. I was just going to say, they're, they're, they're stupid, but they're not. They just need to just sit down or listen to the audio books and try and absorb it that way. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate it. This has been a joy, Chessie. Thank you for having me.